Welcome back to another episode of Harmonious at Lunch, the show that fuels your business success. I'm Brandon Gano, your host and guide through the world of harmonious business growth. Today, we're unlocking powerful strategies with industry experts to help your business thrive. If you're a business owner, entrepreneur, or executive, you are in the right place. Join me and our incredible guest today on the journey to clarity, growth, and success. It is time to revolutionize your approach to business. Let's dive in with another episode of Harmonious at Lunch. Welcome back. We got some more bite-sized business advice. And today's episode, I have been looking forward to recording for at least two weeks now. I posted that I was looking for guests on this show in a Facebook group, scrolling through the comments, and one of them said, leader shit. And I was like, wait a second. This guy made a typo and he said, leader shit on my podcast. And then I found out, no, he was serious. And that's the title of his book. And he's got a website and he was very serious about leadership. So no more pre-framing needed. Jake Brown, welcome to this show. Hey, Brandon, thanks for having me. I could not be more excited for this conversation because I literally almost fell out of my chair laughing when I saw that comment in the Facebook group. But you just told me the backstory before we started recording. So please indulge the listener. Uh, how did we stumble upon leadership and what is it? Yeah, for sure. Um, so in the intro of the book, I describe, um, I went to this management meeting and somebody wasn't there. So I left the meeting and I went to send a typo or I went to send a message and I was trying to say leadership meeting notes, like, Hey, this is what we covered. But instead I had a typo and it said leadership meeting notes and it just blew up that person. Like she just started laughing and other people were asking why. And that those notes got passed around the office and everybody was just laughing and it kind of cut through um, just the mess, you know, that heavy work week, because it was, it was, we had a long weekend that we came back and it was just, uh, you know, just a gauntlet of a week and, uh, everybody just started laughing. And then, you know, a couple of days later, it really hit me that, um, those meetings actually weren't helpful. We weren't leading people with information that came out of those meetings. And I took that personal and, it, um, that typo, uh, cut through a rough day. Then that typo, you know, challenged me to be a better leader and uh, as I was talking to other people, um, I ended up leaving the company and starting my own business. And uh, as uh, you know, as I was talking to other people who were in the business world and everything, I started telling some of the stories of working at this place over and over again. And I compiled all the stories and the tools that we came up with. And uh, that became the book Leadership. And it has been very interesting as people, um, first of all, like you said, um, everywhere assumes it's a typo, including, you know, Grammarly hates it. Like every time I type it, you know, even Amazon like tries to correct it when you put it in. Um, but yeah, it just became this typo that, you know, changed the way that it changed our day, changed our attitude, changed the way that I work, changed my job and it's changed my career. So the typo that changed my life. <laughs> I love it. I mean, listen, at, at our company, at What If, half of what we do is centered around play. You can't grow a business if you're not having fun. That's just, that's one of our core beliefs. Yeah. And what you've done is harness that because you immediately lighten the mood when you see leadership. I told you I was laughing, reading the comment and it, but it makes you open your eyes and, and really listen and pay attention to what's going on. So I, I love this concept and I love everything about it. And I, I love even more what it created and the path that it kind of set you on. So yeah. What we're really going to talk today about is, yeah, we're going to talk about leadership, but we're also going to talk about the six principles to run your business like an airplane, which I'm very excited to see how you got there from the company you were at. But kind of walk me through this journey. Like you had this self-discovery process of realizing that probably all meetings could be an email. My words, <laughs> not yours. But <laughs> that's just my frustration well, with meetings. Real quick, there's yeah, actually please. one of the stories in the book where I talk about um, we're sitting in a bad meeting and an ad pops up on my computer and I buy these candles. And it's a candle that says, this meeting smells like it could have been an email. And I buy <laughs> them for the staff. Like I send this to other people in the staff. And what happens is it becomes a game almost that when you're sitting in a meeting and you don't like the meeting, you light your candle and you slide it into view. And it becomes this thing where we're on Zoom meetings and people are sliding their candles in and it becomes like a badge of honor to be the first one with your candle. And so you said that like 100%. Um, and at the end of that chapter, um, it, it's really about surviving, you know, the bad boss and everything who kept pushing these meetings on us. And I'll give give it away at the end of that chapter. There's a point where the, the boss talks about how cozy and fun it is that everybody has their candles on these Zoom meetings. And we're just kind of like, if you only knew. <laughs> 
oh, you only display the the front, but not the back that says this meeting could oh, have been email. You couldn't read it anyway. I mean, but the, just the <laughs> idea is like, you know, way back in the back, like you, you would stand up and like slide it in or just like yeah. right on the corner of the screen. Yeah, it just became one of those games that uh, we didn't mean for it to be a game. I just thought, hey, here's a candle. And then it became a game. <laughs> All right, I have I have to ask. You said you left the company. Did you get fired from this company? Oh, no, no, <laughs> nope. I love this. This is so much fun. So okay, but I, I want to know, like, walk me through the process because you you had the like the revelation of it's not it's not right for you. You're not the leader you want to be. You're not you're not implementing what you're learning, and then you leave and start your own company. What were some of the things that you set out to accomplish in the first place, starting your company? Yeah. So. Um... I left, um, didn't get fired. Just, it was the time looked at it, and I said, there's no more growth for me here. I need to go do something else. And I left. And one of the first things I wanted to do was help people that, um, were stuck typically with a bad boss or a bad, you know, expectations between. So say like, uh, um, worked with a lot of creative directors where there was an owner of the agency, but the creative director had been promoted to a role where they just didn't have the skill set. Like they were a great artist or a great writer, but they didn't have people management skills. So it's like, OK, I can step into there. And I wanted to help the people that were middle managers. If you think of it that way, I wanted to help them grow. I wanted to help them succeed because um, that's where I came from. And then I realized um, as I was launching my own business, two things became uh, clear very quickly is a lot of small business owners operate as middle managers mm -hmm. stuck between their clients and their staff. And they, you know, they kind of operate like a middle manager in there where they feel like they're torn and they can't, they can't actually make a lot of the decisions. They have to respond more. Um, and the other one was that I found out very quickly, I was the worst boss I had ever had. Um, I just straight up was abusing myself when it came to like time and effort and things like that. And one day um, when I was going back through uh, some of my notes, you know, as I was pulling some of these stories together, I realized that um, if anybody had ever treated me the way that I was treating me when I went out on my own, like they would have been in jail. Like it was not OK. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's true for a lot of small business owners. If you feel triggered, you're not alone. First and foremost, <laughs> let's just address that. But. And there's a path to fix it. But yes, yeah, so what I find is is the same thing. Most small business owners or entrepreneurs start their business or get into business for themselves yeah. because a number of reasons, but either they really love what they're doing and they want to provide that product or service to the marketplace, or they don't want to be a slave to a nine to five. Yeah. One of those two are the most prominent, but what they lack is the realization to say, I need to build a business. I'm not just building a job. And it yeah. sounds like what you realized was when you're working so hard, you're beating yourself up, you built yourself a job and that it was, can't sustain itself. It was by far the worst job I've ever had um, until I got control of it, you know, until I took a step back into leading myself and uh, really simplifying my business. Um, so I, I like to kind of to what you were saying earlier, the idea of you jump out because you're good at something. I was good at things. I was really great at them. And I jumped out and I thought, oh, I'm going to go do this all the time. And what it became was I was only doing what I was good at maybe 20% of the time. And the other 80 plus percent of the time I was doing what I call businessing. It was like, I did not start a business to run a business. I completely missed that huge portion of it, you know? And when I launched out, I was like, okay, I have a hobby. I have to get paid. Now I have to do it as business. And then I realized I was spending so much time doing the businessing that um, I needed to simplify it. And really, I needed to figure out in each element of the business, I need to do like the 20% that would get the 80% results. I needed to not do all the businessing, but do enough businessing to do things right. And obviously to stay out of jail. Like nobody wants to, you know, go into like IRS jail or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, that, that stuff's important. Yes. <laughs> I love this though. This, this is our whole, this is what we teach. This is our model. Our business model is what's the 20% that's going to get the 80% lift and do nothing else because that that's where the magic is because not only the business owner, but also we make sure that that trickles down to the employees. Yeah. They don't want to be doing all the busy work that's meaningless. Anyway, when you give somebody a task that results in absolutely nothing for both themselves or the company, I mean, they start to figure that out pretty quickly and they, the morale of the company goes yeah. down. And some things could happen, like people could start putting candles on Zoom meetings that that <laughs> could potentially get you fired. So this is why this whole thing comes together. And I love the 80-20 principle. So from there, we have the six principles. Yep. Have I jumped ahead too far? 
No. Where, where do the six principles come in? Yeah, so um, this is actually um, part of the training and certification that I have as a business coach and consultant. We That's what we talk about is the six parts of a business and you use this airplane analogy. And the idea is that the leadership is the cockpit. They're in constant conversation. You're looking to the future. You're talking about like, what are the weather conditions? What's it like gonna we, when we get there? And they're the ones that make sure everything, you know, the, the whole thing is moving in the right direction. Um, and they're the ones that actually make it move, you know, without, without leadership, without a cockpit, it goes nowhere. So that's the leadership. That's the first one. That's the cockpit. And then the next one typically talk about our uh, sales and marketing. And those are the engines of the airplane. They're the ones that add the thrust without movement, without anything going. They're also the ones that burn fuel. So when you think about that, sales and marketing tend to burn fuel pretty quickly um, because they convert fuel. They convert, you know, resources into motion. So what you have to do is you look at that and you say, okay, well, then what is the fuel? Well, the fuel tanks, that's your cash flow. Um, just like anything else, you got to have a steady supply of it, but you burn through it. Um, so when you're thinking of your cash flow, re really no cash, you crash. Like that's the idea. You have to have it. You have to have some reserves. Um, and then if you think of your products and services as the wings, you want them to be as kind of as big as possible to bring people in, but they have to be as light as possible. They can't cost a lot of money. Like that's how you're profitable. So you want to get a lot of lift without a lot of dead weight on your plane. And then there's the fuselage, you know, the body of the airplane. Um, you just, when you're thinking through that, you really want it to be as light as possible. So when you have your, it's your overhead, it's your staff and it's like the meetings, the time. So if you're scheduling a ton of meetings that are just wasting time, um, for, for instance, in my book, I talk about, I used to sit in meetings and count how many people were there and how many hours, like how much time did we spend in here? And then I would project that out as, first of all, what did we not bill? And what did we just pay for this meeting? Like we have 12 people in this meeting and you think about that and you're like, that's like, if that hour, if that meeting goes from an hour to an hour and a half, you got 12 people, that's 18, first of all, 18 billable hours that you didn't do, but 18 hours of salary basically that you're paying. Like we just, we just bought those 18 hours and got nothing in return typically. So what you want to do is you want to think about your staff and your equipment and specifically meetings and how you're being efficient with your time. That's the overhead because the point of an airplane is to move things from one place to another. But you don't want it to be a bunch of, like I said, dead weight that just costs a bunch of money. So that's the simple idea of the airplane. Um, but then you know, there's there are frameworks and things that you can put into place to make sure the airplane's in the right order. Because, like I said, if, if your overhead's too big, then you got this huge, massive, you know, bubble of an airplane with these little itty bitty wings. It can't take off. Like it's it's just going to crash as soon as you start. So. Yeah, I I like the concept. The analogy is really really good. I'm curious though about the from the meeting perspective because obviously this is what prompted your whole journey is is the inefficiency of meetings. So can you can you give me some pointers on how to effectively run a meeting and who yeah. should be there? Because uh, the, that's something that you should really ask yourself as a listener. That point of how much a meeting costs is crazy. I used to do the same thing before I had my own business. I would be like, this me, I knew everybody's salary in the room because I was yeah. higher up in the company. And I was like, this meeting just cost us $7,000. And I was like, what is happening? This yeah. is absurd. Like there are definitely times that you look around and you're like, we could just bought everybody a really nice watch and it would have been yeah. faster and cheaper. <laughs> um, so when it comes to the meetings, the first thing I tell people is determine if it's a meeting or a gathering, because what drives me crazy is most of them were gatherings at the company I was at. It's about getting it's cultural. It's about getting people in the same. If you think having people in the same room was a success, then it is not a meeting. But there were times that, you know, we did need to be in the same room. We needed to be, especially when we were remote, when we'd come together, you know, I would be like, all right, you know, all staff meeting. And we'd walk in there. I'm like, this is not a meeting. Once I started understanding the difference, it's a gathering. Now I know what to expect. But when I was going to walk into a meeting, I always, there is a decision to be made. Like anytime there's a meeting, there's some, it's driving toward a thing. Everybody will know that we're done when we get here. And my favorite way to frame a meeting is if you're familiar with the movie Princess Bride, it says, no. uh, okay, so there's a character. It's, it's a great movie. You need to watch it. Um, but there's a guy, he says, it's, his name's Inigo Montoya. He says, it's a famous line that he says over and over. And he goes, hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. 
and I tell people when you're planning a meeting, there are three things you need to say. Hello, my name is Nico Montoya. Like, who is there? List who is there. Okay, you killed my father. That's the problem. So everybody's here because of this problem. Everybody has a stake in that problem. And then the last part is prepare to die. You know when this meeting is over because when this meeting is over, you will be dead. So when I think of a meeting, I say, who's there? And everybody has an aspect to solve that problem or make that decision. They all have some kind of stake in the goal of that meeting. And you define what is the finish line. Like when we are done, it will look like this or we will solve this problem. We will have a solution or um, sometimes it's even a we will have defined steps to take. You know, like we're going to look at this issue and we're going to figure out what the next steps are. That's fine. But most meetings that you walk into, nobody has a clue. There's no agenda. There's no nothing. Um, now, I do think that there are update meetings and that's fine. I also think that most update meetings can just be a link to a dashboard, to be honest. Like, <laughs> click it because there are so many times that you go in, you look at a dashboard, you walk into a meeting, and you realize that you just spent 30 minutes where they read you an email that you already read. And then they explain a dashboard, and you're like, I actually looked at an updated version of the dashboard before the meeting, so I know better numbers than were in the email. Um, again, if it's a gathering, call it a gathering. People know what to expect. If you tell people, this is the meeting, this is the problem that we're solving, this is why you're here, and this is, you know, this is the outcome of the meeting, the expected outcome, people will show up with better resources, and meetings end up going faster. Because if you know why you're walking into the meeting, you can either read ahead of time, bring the resources, refresh your, you know, your uh, kind of refresh yourself on maybe, you know, a blog you read or some article or something that you, you know that is out there, or it could even be like information from a client. You could go get data that you need to make the decision. But a lot of times, you know, it's the everybody in the company, you're just, you're just randomly on this meeting that says like, you know, uh, leadership meeting. 10 30 a.m. That's it. And you walk in and you're like, so, you know, I always think when you walk in, if you remember the movie Jungle Book, those vultures is there. What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? Like, I felt like so many meetings were that. It was like, well, it's just time to gather. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And I, I always hated that concept of just like walking into a meeting and then the first whatever portion, whether it's five seconds or or 15 minutes of like educating the room of why we're here first of all wildly inefficient yes. nobody wants to sit through that but also like a, most people need time to sit with something before they can add value to the conversation or, or even contribute to a decision so if we spend 15 minutes on education and then the next 15 minutes on brainstorming imagine the the quality of ideas we could have had if that first 30 minutes yeah. was summarized in an email that took everybody 30 seconds to read and then they can or, sit with it. Or my favorite, use the meeting invite to disc like to explain why you're having a meeting. Like that's how many crazy. People, don't, people do that? don't use those things for that. Okay. <laughs> Let's like not go off the rails here. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was uh that would be one of my things. Like we'd walk into a meeting and be like, Did you read the like somebody be like, So why are we here? I'm like, Did you read the meeting notes? Like it's literally in the meeting invite. I refuse to create a meeting without telling somebody why they're there. That is um, if I'm not prepared enough to tell you why you should be there, why yeah. should you be pre be prepared enough to participate was always my thought as a leader. That's a good, that's a good point. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put your website on the screen here to go grab your book leadership.co. If you're listening, it's in the show notes. If you're watching, it's also in the show notes down below. Um, and I want to talk about that too, but I want to ask you one last question before we get there. Tell me about what is, what are we going to find at leadership.co and who, who should go there? Yeah. to find so, what you have there's real quick there are three people that i found that have really been impacted by the book or really enjoyed it one of them is you're in a bad work situation and you're just kind of like you need to let off some steam you need to read the story and you need to kind of be inspired on how to get out um that is one audience that's there um but most of them are actually getting the book from someone else like a loved one who's basically tired of hearing them complain about it. Like, you know, a, you know, a partner, a spouse, a parent, they're like, I am tired of hearing you complain about your job. Read this. And first off, it's hilarious. And it's not just me saying that I've got 53 reviews on Amazon saying that it's hilarious. Like all of them are <laughs> like, this is hilarious. Um, so the idea of 
those are the people that are typically going there. But then there's another group of people that are reading it and they're actually healing. Somewhere in our past, we've had a bad job. We've had a bad boss. And you read it and it's kind of like sitting around telling stories at a campfire kind of thing. Where it's kind of like, oh yeah, I got one of those. And I would say those people are the ones who that wound has now become a scar. And we're sitting around talking about the trophies that we've had. Um, and those are typically the people that have become a leader and they've got the scars, but it reminds them not to become that leader. You know, remember what it's like to lead people. Don't be the bad boss. So those are kind of the three people that are typically going there. Um, some of the stuff that's going to get there. If, when you land on the website, there's a, a banner where you can like sign up, you know, sign up for the email list. It's not for the email. I mean, it kind of is, but I don't email much on there. The idea is you can get some of the free resources. Um, one of them, for instance, my favorite resource in the whole thing is a, a it's a Mad Lib style resignation letter. Like how many times do people stay in a, in a bad job because they just don't know how to quit? Like pull this thing down, fill it out. It's a good one. There are also like hilarious ones just for letting off steam. I do not recommend using them in real life. If you do, please email me and tell you <laughs> what you did though. Because one of them's like how to quit like a pirate. And, you know, like they're just ridiculous things like that, like kid Mad Libs, just to make it a little bit more fun. Um, and then we've got the world's, what is it? It's the world's best airplanes on the planet is uh, what they are. They're paper airplanes that we made in a bad work situation, just trying to pass meetings, trying to pass some time. And we got really, really great at building these paper airplanes. And my son gave them the name because he thinks they're awesome. Um, so there's fun things on there. There's resources. There's an outline um, how to run a meeting that I use. Um, there's another one I call it the gold medal uh, worksheet. It's uh, to keep people from meddling, whether it be clients or the boss or anything. It's metal, M-E-D-D-L-E, -E, like interfering. Um, another typo that just became a thing. Um, but there's a lot of resources like that that are really helpful, easy to use, and also just goofy things like bingo sheets and uh, paper airplanes, uh, Mad Lib resignation letters. Like one of them's like pretending that you're Shakespeare quitting, like you plug in the stuff and it comes back. It's hilarious. Um, so like I said, it, it's a mixture of tools that are good and helpful and other tools that are just, um, to make you laugh and remember that like, man, there, there's gotta be play and work. Otherwise it's just torture. And that leads me to the last question. Thank you for teeing that up because I have to know I've sat through too many, e uh, too many meetings that could have been emails. You have to, you make candles out of it. So you, you're more dedicated than I am. How do we make meetings fun? Give me the simplified version of how to make a meeting fun and also get something done. Oh, man. So the first thing that you can do to make meetings fun is just cancel half of them. Like <laughs> from the beginning, like if you can just get them off of people's calendars and stuff. But the other thing, it's not so much what you can do in the meeting, but if you will respect the people coming to the meeting, remember, you've you've asked them to step out of something else that's important to them, whether it be their job, their role, billable hours, anything like that. If you're going to invite them into a meeting, make sure they know what's going on and why they're valuable to that meeting. Because if people know that they bring value into the meeting, then they're going to show up and it's going to be a lot more fun. Um, now, I'm not saying you have to be controlling and have a super tight agenda and all that kind of stuff. Like you can have fun in the meeting, but just respect the other people. You know, like respect them coming in and respect them to let them go. Um, now, what do I do in meetings? I throw Legos on the table and I'm like, here you guys, here we go. Like you got to have something to fidget with, something to uh, break it up, be a little bit different than normal. Um, but yeah, uh, if you can do Legos and you can let people know why they're there, they're going to have a lot more fun. They're going to be more engaged. That's amazing. And the creativity that's going to come out of it is is just fueled by the creativity that you put on the table in the Legos. For Phenomenal. sure. Jake, this was, this was too much fun. I really appreciate you coming here. And I so appreciate that you are the man of many typos because this, <laughs> this interview probably would not have happened otherwise. So thank you for being here. Awesome. It's been a blast. All right. For you, the listener, the watcher, wherever you are, make sure you subscribe. If you haven't already, we do this for you. We want to bring you the disruptive business bite-sized advice so you can get out of the rut, grow your business, take it to the next level. We'll see you on the next episode of Harmonious at Lunch. Thanks.